old-fashioned murder and mayhem. Beauty is the Beast, Winona Olena Spriggs, 1924. It was past midnight on August 17, 1924, when Major James A. Pitcock, Chief Detective of the Little Rock, Arkansas Police Department, was called to the scene of a body found lying on the railroad tracks. The shaken engineer of Rock Island Engine Number 47 had managed to stop the train in the nick of time, but the victim was dead nonetheless. Several other employees of the Iron Mountain Railroad were also gathered there. The bullet-ridden body they had discovered was a fellow employee, 55-year-old J.R. Robert Green, a switchman for the railroad for over 30 years. Major Pitcock's trained eye scanned the area for clues. To his surprise, small imprints of a woman's shoes could clearly be seen. Reaching down, the detective picked up a small rhinestone-covered buckle and slipped it into his pocket. This was no random robbery. There was a woman involved. Welcome to another episode of Old Fashioned Murder and Mayhem. I am your host, Mindy Hudson, bringing you tales of scandal and true crime with a twist of genealogy. Join me as we discover the fascinating story of Beauty is the Beast, Winona Olena Spriggs. James R. Green, called Robert, had made a good life for his small family. He married the former Lena Stokey in 1894 and worked as a switchman for the Iron Mountain Railroad. Their one child, Leroy, was born in 1895. Robert was meticulous in everything he did. He bought a luxurious home at 1811 West 5th Street in Little Rock, a sprawling two-story house with a wide veranda that wrapped around the front and side with a turreted addition. His life seemed to be the model American dream. Loyal to his wife, his son, and his job, it was said you could set your clock by his routine. Every day for 33 years, he walked the short distance to the switch tower where he worked. At 12.45 at night, he finished his shift and began the three-block trek back home. On Saturday, August 16, 1924, Robert Green ended his shift after midnight. It was now early Sunday, August 17, and Robert followed his long-established routine. Major Pitcock confirmed that the middle-aged gentleman had worked his regular hours and followed the same route he had taken for three decades. Following the railroad tracks from the tower, he took the lonely shortcut on the hill to a crossroads where he veered onto the streets leading to his house. Evidence of a woman's presence in the dust at the crossroads led the seasoned detective to consider there had possibly been a late-night meeting with a secret lover, and something had gone wrong. However, upon arriving at the Green family's West 5th Street home, Pitcock was met with a very distraught widow, a grieving son, and a stunningly beautiful daughter-in-law. Delving into the private life of Robert Green, Pitcock was puzzled to find evidence supporting Robert had no wondering eye, but was a devoted man to his wife. Robbery didn't appear to have been the motive, as nothing was taken from the body. Son Leroy and his bride Winona had only arrived at Little Rock a few hours earlier from their home in Pueblo, Colorado. Something wasn't adding up. J.A. Pitcock wasn't some backwoods detective. He knew the key to the mystery lay in the mysterious appearance of the female shoe prints and the rhinestone buckle. He began by discreetly checking the shoe shops around Little Rock to find anyone who might remember selling a pair of shoes with that particular adornment. The search eventually extended to all of Arkansas without luck. In the meantime, Pitcock checked the alibis given by Leroy and Winona Green. They had arrived in Arkansas separately. 
According to Winona, she had planned to make a visit alone and had arrived about eight hours after the murder had occurred, only to be stunned by the news that Dad Green had been killed. In the meantime, Mother Green, overcome with grief, had called her son to come home. He arrived several hours after Winona. While Leroy's timeline of events was ironclad, Winona's had troubling holes. Small changes in details sent Pitcock's suspicious antenna into action. Leroy had assured his distraught mother that the couple would remain with her as she grieved for the loss of her husband. In the meantime, Pitcock made a trip to Pueblo to gather whatever information he could on the son and his wife. Remembering to carry the rhinestone buckle with him, he made visits to area shoe shops where his first stroke of luck revealed that Winona Green had bought a pair of shoes from a local dealer with those very buckles on August 7th, just days prior to the murder. Armed with this information, Pitcock returned to Little Rock and, in September, obtained a search warrant for the Green's 5th Street residence. The house was empty at the time the warrant was executed, but another startling clue was found once officers began sifting through the house. A torn note, presumably written by Lena Green to Winona, contained the astonishing message, quote, if you want the $4,000 I borrowed from you, you'll have to help me find some way of getting it from the old man. I have a good plan that we can work out when you come to Little Rock. Please don't let Leroy know anything about this, will you, honey? Was Lena Green also involved in the murder of her husband? Pitcock was about to issue warrants for the arrest of both Lena Green and Winona Green when he discovered that the whole family had been missing for three days. While they waited to locate the suspects, Pitcock checked the local bank where he learned that around the time of the disappearance of the Greens, the bank had been presented with a draft for $2,000, said to have been purchased by Mrs. Lena Green. The transaction was traced to a bank in Oklahoma where days before Mrs. Winona Green arrived with the draft endorsed to her. Because of the amount was so large, the bank only cashed out $200 and wrote another draft for the additional $1,800 to be available once the funds were secured from Arkansas. Upon closer inspection, it appeared that Mrs. Lena Green's signature was a forgery. Joining forces with Pueblo, Colorado law enforcement, Pitcock found that Winona Green had sent a telegram at 10 a.m. on Friday, August 15th from Pueblo to Mrs. Robert Green. Quote, am leaving on the rainbow this afternoon at 4 o'clock, Winona, end quote. That meant Winona had actually arrived in Little Rock at least eight hours before the murder of Robert Green. At this point, authorities placed 24-hour surveillance on the couple's 12th Street house in Pueblo. It was October 1st when the two strolled up to their door, only to be surrounded by police and quickly arrested. Both seemed completely surprised by the arrest. Winona was charged with first-degree murder and Leroy was held for questioning in the death of his father. 23-year-old Winona remained calm and indifferent. However, her confidence crumbled when Major Pitcock remarked, quote, You made one blunder, Winona. Otherwise, we might have never known who killed old Bob Green, end quote. What blunder was that? The beauty smugly replied. That's when he told her she had lost the rhinestone buckle at the crime scene from one of the shoes she had purchased in Pueblo. In addition, he had proof she had arrived in Little Rock hours before the murder. Pitcock had played his hand perfectly. Her cool demeanor was shaken. The color drained from her lovely face, but then a wicked smile formed on her lips. Yes, I killed him, she said. There is no doubt about it, Winnie Spriggs Green was beautiful. 
born October 21, 1901, to William Spriggs and Mary Hood, Winona Olena was the eldest of three children. Her dark brown eyes and long raven hair gave her an exotic allure. She later claimed to be part Cherokee, but like most things Winnie claimed, that was a fantasy. Perhaps the loss of her mother in Oklahoma as the family traveled from Arkansas headed to New Mexico left a mark on the six-year-old child. The heartbreaking account of Mary Spriggs' death is recounted in the Oklahoma Gotibo Gazette on December 20, 1907. The article begins, Died Among Strangers. Mrs. W. L. Spriggs was born brought to the Richardson Hotel Sunday in an unconscious condition, supposed to have been brought about by a tumor on the brain, and soon after passed away. With her husband and three small children, the woman had been traveling overland from the Creek Nation to New Mexico, where they intended to make their home. Friday, she was taken, taken to the hotel. She was in a dying condition. The family was in poor circumstances, and a subscription was circulated and sufficient funds procured to provide for decent interment and to assist the stricken family temporarily. End quote. The article goes on to describe the service and a card of thanks from the family signed by W. L. Spriggs, his father, and his father in law. The journey to New Mexico continued shortly after. By the 1910 census, W. L. Spriggs and his children, Winnie, Thelma, and William, were living in Guadalupe County, New Mexico. By 1920, Spriggs moved to Ottawa County, Oklahoma, with the two younger children, but Winnie is missing from the census. She later claimed that most of her childhood was spent shuffling from one relative to another. By the time she was a teenager, trouble seemed to find her. There were some rumors that she was married to a bootlegger at the age of 18, and a son was born to her. Newspaper articles later claimed the boy was sent to live with relatives in Kansas City, but no proof of the marriage or the existence of a child has been found. Winona, also called Winnie, married Leroy Robert Green in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, on January 31, 1923. He listed his residence as Little Rock, and she listed hers as Fayetteville, Arkansas. Leroy was tall and muscular, with blue eyes and light-colored hair. The marriage to Winnie was not his first. He was briefly married in 1917 to Miss Beulah Journey, but sought and received a divorce in 1919 on grounds of desertion. After the 1923 wedding to Winona, the couple made their home with Leroy's parents until the young man secured a railroad job in Pueblo, most likely with the aid of his father. After the murder of Robert Green, the couple returned to Pueblo in September, presumably to close out their affairs before returning to Little Rock to care for Mrs. Green. On September 24, 1924, Winnie left on a short trip saying she was going to Kansas City to visit relatives. She went first to Little Rock and picked up Mother Green. The pair left by train. Curiously, both women had railroad passes which enabled them to travel free on the train whenever and wherever they chose, but instead they bought tickets which possibly occurred to avoid train employees from being aware of their movements. At the time of her arrest, Winnie insisted that during the trip, she and Mother Green had quarreled over a loan the young woman claimed her mother-in-law owed to her. The argument grew heated, and Winnie said she had left the woman in Kansas City. In the meantime, Winnie wired Leroy to tell him about the disagreement and asked him to come to meet her in Colorado City as she was coming home. When pressed about what happened to his mother, Winnie said she believed the woman was going to Oklahoma, where some of her siblings resided. Leroy called his uncles to inquire whether Mrs. Green had arrived, but no one had seen her. 
All of this was still unfolding when Leroy and Winona Green were taken in for questioning. At this point, it was unclear whether Winona had acted alone or if her husband, who had a tainted history of his own, was involved. There was also the suspicion that Lena Green was involved in the murder plot of Robert Green. Pitcock was determined to leave no stone unturned. Winnie was coy with the investigators, appearing to relish the attention she was receiving. It had been a near-perfect murder. There were no witnesses, only circumstantial evidence, and no obvious motive. If the young woman could have maintained her composure, she might have gotten away with it. But her one weakness was that she apparently truly loved Leroy. After being grilled mercilessly for hours, he asked to see his wife. The battered and bruised condition of her beloved husband shocked her. He begged her if she knew anything about his father's murder to please tell, and the strategy worked. She broke down crying hysterically and insisted that Leroy had nothing to do with the killing. He was completely innocent. If she thought her bravado in rescuing her husband from the brutal tactics of investigators would soften his heart toward her, she made a dire miscalculation. The details she shared changed with every retelling, but most of the accounts including some variation of the following. According to Winnie, she had loaned $4,000 to Mother Green in December 1923 without the knowledge of her husband or father-in-law. She never explained where she received that sum of money in the first place. Winnie claimed Dad Green was a tyrant with his money, and although Mother lived in apparent luxury, she had to scrape for every penny she received. The following year, Winnie asked for the loan to be repaid, but Mother had ignored her request. One version claimed that the reason she was so desperate for the repayment was support her four-year-old son who was living in Kansas City with relatives. Again, no proof has been found confirming this claim. In a final effort to reclaim the money, Winnie said that she made a secret trip to Little Rock to tell Dad Green about the loan and demand that he repay it. But when confronted, he refused and she shot him. At this point, Pitcock likely confronted Winona with the torn letter he had found implicating Lena Green. It was then that Winona claimed that Mother Green was in on the scheme and said that the only way they could get the money was to collect a $10,000 life insurance policy held on Robert. Lena didn't have the courage to go through with the murder, but knew Winona could do it. Afterward, the elder woman planned to collect the insurance and give back the $4,000. Winnie insisted that neither woman wanted Leroy to know about the plan, so the young woman arrived early on the day of the murder and stayed out of sight until Dad was due to get off work. She readily admitted that it was she who lay in wait for her father-in-law and shot him. She spent the rest of the night and most of the following day at the train station and library until the afternoon train arrived, giving her a believable alibi. Pitcock continued to press Winnie about what had happened to Lena Green since her disappearance. The quest to locate the woman was ongoing when Widona's murder trial was scheduled to take place in October. By October 13th, Winnie finally confessed that she had killed her mother-in-law, but insisted it was in self-defense. Mother knew that Winnie was the only one who could testify to her being complicit in the murder of her husband. She said the elder woman asked her to come to Little Rock and make a trip with her to Oklahoma, where she wanted to show her some property she owned there. They took a train to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the two women disembarked and rented a car. Winnie slipped away and bought a pistol using the name Hattie Loring. Oklahoma law required her fingerprints when purchasing a gun, so they were able to confirm that transaction. Her excuse for the gun purchase was that she feared what Mother Green was going to do. The women took a trip in the automobile through Fisher, Oklahoma, up a mountainous road with few dwellings. It was here that a confrontation took place. 
Winnie said mother told her that her next victim would be her own son as she began choking the terrified girl. That's when Winnie pulled the weapon and emptied the gun into the woman. After giving this testimony, Winnie finally directed the authorities to where the body could be found. Her decomposing body was found propped against a large rock some distance off the road. There were vultures circling overhead. Obviously, everything about Winona's story strained credibility. The more probable account was that Winona saw an opportunity to gain a great fortune by wiping out the family and collecting insurance. She was set to gain money, an impressive home in a desired neighborhood of Little Rock, and the prestige that eluded her in her youth. Whether Leroy truly was unaware of the scheme cannot be known. As mentioned earlier, he had his own sordid past. In 1907, at the age of 12, Leroy was in the company of two boys from his neighborhood when they caused the death of a 10-year-old black boy by the name of Will Wilson. The three boys, Alfred and Raymond Drinkwater, and Leroy Green, ages 10 and 12, were throwing stones at the youth when one large stone struck the child in the head, fracturing his skull. In fear for his life, the injured youngster ran several blocks before jumping into a creek below Union Depot, where he drowned. The boys were arrested and charged with murder. Shockingly, they claimed they didn't know it was illegal to kill a Negro. And despite the fact they admitted to throwing stones, they were released due to lack of physical proof that the stones they threw caused the child's death. This wasn't the last of Leroy's antics. The following year, J.R. Green published an advertisement in the Daily Arkansas Gazette asking for information pertaining to the whereabouts of his 13-year-old son who had been missing for a week. Eight days after his disappearance, he was located at the home of an uncle near Arkadelphia, Arkansas. Local friends admitted that after playing in the creek with some boys, Leroy had, quote, taken a sudden fancy to go visiting, end quote. He'd hopped aboard a locomotive without his parents' knowledge and went to visit relatives along the way. No one was suspicious about it as the boy led them to believe his parents were aware of his plans. Whatever the involvement Leroy may have had in the deaths of his parents, the confession of his beautiful bride turned him sour against her. He declared that he wanted nothing further to do with her and began divorce proceedings. For her part, she was visibly hurt at first, but then embraced her notoriety with gusto, flirting with reporters and treating her predicament as if it were a giddy diversion. Found guilty of the murder of her father-in-law, Winona Green was sent to the Little Rock Jail to await her appeal. She never showed any remorse for either killing, but worried more about the fact that she had unmanicured nails and lacked the attention of a beauty parlor. Thank goodness my hair is naturally curly. That helps some, she lamented. Her appeal was denied in March 1925, and with the prospect of going to the Jacksonville Women's Farm, a place notorious for its treatment of female prisoners, Winona made a desperate plan to flee the Pulaski Jail. Ever resourceful, she somehow managed to secure a file and patiently worked for weeks sawing through the bars of the cell she shared with other female inmates. One Saturday night in mid-April 1925, she finally broke through the third bar. She asked the cellmates if they wanted to join her, but eyeing the dizzying 20-foot drop from the window, they declined. It was 10 p.m. when the petite beauty slipped through the bars and landed on the ground below. She made her way to the Missouri Pacific Railroad, where she boarded a train to Union Station in Memphis. If she had continued with her daring bravado, she might have gotten away, but fearing she would be spotted, she slipped through the railroad yards and was spotted by a veteran police officer who stopped her to ask what she was doing out there. Fear gripped her, and she admitted that she was Winona Green and the police were looking for her. 
she had enjoyed about nine hours of freedom. Soon afterward, Winona was sent to the dreaded Jacksonville farm. It took her only a year and two months to determine that this was not the place for her. Two other prisoners walked out of the facility with her on a Tuesday night around 8 p.m., Eunice Gregory and Ada Mae Smith. Mrs. Julia Roberts, the superintendent of the women's prison, believed the women had help from outside sources in their escape. They were captured two days later, hiding in a clump of woods near an old aviation field in Lonoke, Arkansas. It was because of photographs of Winona that were circulated in the area that caused a local farmer to report he had picked up three hitchhiking women, one matching Winona's description, and dropped them at Lonoke. When returned to the farm, Winona defiantly remarked to the Gazette reporter, quote, you can tell the public that I kept my promise good to escape and that I'll be gone again soon. I'll take my 25 lashes and two months' confinement on bread and water with a smile, but I'll not stay. They may shoot me in the back, but I much prefer such a death to starvation. End quote. Winona scoffed at the idea that their escape was aided by a guard. I made my own key which she produced for the reporter to see, she said. Winona's comment about the treatment she was due to receive were the catalyst for a series of events that would eventually lead to the downfall of the corrupt Arkansas prison system of the early 20th century. She eerily foreshadowed an event that would occur less than a decade later, which may have been inspired by her own escape attempts. Shortly after the women returned to the prison, a firestorm of controversy broke out when a former inmate, Leona Bruce, swore out an affidavit claiming the three prisoners had been mercilessly flogged and tortured at the prison. According to the document, the three inmates were shackled to a whipping post and given 13 lashes. Quote, I heard the licks and heard the screams of the women, the affidavit states. It was common knowledge in the jail, but everyone was told to remain quiet or be punished. The girls say he gave them 13 lashes and beat them with a long leather strap until the blood came, end quote. The allegations were picked up and printed nationwide, and a formal investigation was launched. Mrs. Julia Roberts, the superintendent of the prison, strictly denied that the women were whipped. Quote, Neither Winona Green or any other woman prisoner has been whipped at the state farm, said Mrs. Roberts. There is absolutely no truth in the charge. End quote. Unsurprisingly, a committee of four did what was considered an investigation, and according to a report in the August 5, 1926 edition of Shawnee Morning News, Oklahoma, quote, the committee said the report in its investigation gave special emphasis to the alleged whippings widely reported in a sensational newspaper as having been inflicted in a brutal manner on three desperate women recaptured after an attempted escape and found on the testimony of each victim herself that the facts had been badly distorted and needlessly exaggerated. It is true that exemplary punishment was inflicted on each of the women who tried to escape, but according to the statements of the victims, the nature of the punishment was light and moderate and did not even border on the brutal and inhumane, end quote. As far as the Arkansas prison system was concerned, the matter was settled Having been emboldened by the exoneration of wrongdoing by the female prisoners, the die was cast for the events that brought about the murder of Helen Spence a few years later. For more information on that story, please see the podcast, River Justice, Helen Ruth Spence. With the failure of the Jacksonville farm escape attempt, much of the fire appeared to drain from Winona. She spent her time reading magazines and writing unpublished romance pieces. By 1930, she developed tuberculosis, and a recommendation was made to send her to the Arkansas State Tuberculosis Hospital. 
However, the facility refused to admit a murder convict. A compromise was made to release Winona Green on parole into the care of her sister, Thelma, who lived in Ottawa County, Oklahoma, with her husband, Lynn Voiles, and their children. With this second chance at life, you might imagine why Nona would count her blessings and live a quiet, peaceful life. However, that was not the course she chose. On December 17, 1932, she married Herbert F. Jones from Arkansas, who was recently divorced from his first wife on a charge of cruelty. Her life of crime ramped up again in November 1935, as her parole was revoked when she was arrested for forging checks in Little Rock. This resulted in Winnie being returned to Jacksonville Farm. H. L. Jones filed for divorce in 1938, citing abandonment. Again, in 1939, Winnie was given parole by retiring prosecuting attorney Fred A. Donham because of her poor health and because she had reportedly aided in rescuing several of the female inmates when a fire broke out at the prison. She returned to the Voiles' home to live. Winnie and the girl's father, W. L. Spriggs, 67, were listed in the household in the 1940 federal census. Soon, Winona ended up in California where she was working in a shipyard. This is where she met James E. Freeman, who was nearly 20 years her junior. Nevertheless, the pair were married in 1944 and spent the next few years alternating residence between California and Oklahoma. Shortly after World War II had ended, the pair managed to move into the California residence of Francis Frank Perricone. While there, Winona convinced the man to convert his property into cash and buy a Packard automobile with some of it. The pair coerced the man to take the proceeds and travel with them to Miami, Oklahoma. Arriving in Oklahoma, Perricone became ill and was admitted into the Miami Baptist Hospital in April 1946. He died the next month. Of course, Winnie and her husband disappeared with the remaining money and the auto, according to a letter written to Perricone's son, Alfred, shortly before the elder man died. In January 1948, Winona once again found herself in trouble for issuing forged checks in Oklahoma. Yet again, her parole was briefly revoked, and she returned to Arkansas to serve out her sentence. Nonetheless, in October 1949, her husband, James Freeman, requested that she be allowed to return to California, where he was working so that she could receive proper medical treatment. Unbelievably, his request was granted, and Winnie was granted a 90-day furlough by Arkansas Governor McMath. The furlough was extended multiple times throughout the early 1950s. Winnie and James Freeman moved into a very tiny cottage in Salinas, California, on Paradise Valley Road, where he worked as a dishwasher, and she took care of as many as 30 cats, earning her the moniker the cat woman. At 53, her former beauty had faded after years of hard living. In December 1953, Winnie became embroiled in another scandal when she was brought in for questioning over more forged checks. This time, the victim was an elderly, retired rancher named Harold Jonathan, who had been missing since late November. Winnie was known to be a close friend of the 78-year-old, even going so far as to refer to him chillingly as Daddy Jonathan. True to her lifelong pattern, she forged and cashed checks using Jonathan's name. Upon questioning, she finally admitted that Jonathan was dead, but that the shooting had been accidental. According to her testimony, the pair had planned to go turkey hunting, but decided to target practice beforehand. They went to a garbage dump in Old Castroville Boulevard, where Jonathan stepped in front of her as she aimed at some old cans. Realizing her reputation would create suspicion, she panicked and hid the body. 
Authorities believe Jonathan confronted her over the stolen funds and was murdered. News of the murder investigation was the catalyst that reopened another case that had grown cold in Oklahoma. In August 1946, the bullet-pierced body of a man weighted down with rocks and iron was pulled from the waters of Grand Lake near Miami, Oklahoma. The man was identified as World War II veteran named Robert Sheldon Wilkinson. He was the son of Kenneth Wilkinson of New York, who was assistant to the president of AT&T. Over $1,800 was found hidden inside the Army-style belt worn by the victim. The Oklahoma detective who worked on the case recalled Winnie Freeman's association with the Paraconi case, which occurred in the vicinity only months before the Wilkinson discovery, and had considered the Freemans, who lived only two miles from the scene, might know something about the murder. An unnamed witness had claimed when news of the money discovered in Wilkinson's belt came out, Winnie was heard to remark, quote, so that's where the SOB kept his money, end quote. Winnie's trial for the murder of Jonathan was held in March 1954. While this was happening, warrants were issued in Oklahoma for Winnie and James Freeman in connection with the 1946 murder of Robert Wilkinson. Winnie was found guilty of the slaying of Harold Jonathan and received another life sentence on March 23rd by Superior Judge Henry Jorgensen, who made it clear he believed she deserved the gas chamber. As she was led away to the Corona Women's Prison in Riverside, California, she asked the jailer to, quote, take care of my baby, end quote, referring to Jim, her husband, who was in his 30s. Since she was already serving two life sentences for murder, Winnie was not extradited to Oklahoma to be tried for Wilkinson's death. Fortunately for Jim Freeman, the charges against him were dropped for lack of evidence. He sued for divorce in 1971. Winnie Olena Spriggs died on October 30, 1974, just a little over a week after her 74th birthday. Once described as, quote, the most beautiful woman ever to enter the Arkansas penitentiary, end quote, she died bearing the markings of a lifetime as a criminal. At the time of her trial in 1954, Winnie pointed out the abuse she had suffered during her time at the Arkansas prison. Quote, I was horribly beaten and stomped by the night watchman, she said, adding that he used a strap and handle. She said she was struck over 20 times and pointed to scars on her face, hands, hip, thigh, elbow, and knuckles, end quote. An October 31, 1974 article written in the Redland Daily Facts, California, stated, quote, Winnie Spriggs was a gentle old woman with a lively twinkle in her eyes and a quick wit, the savior of countless stray cats, and a good neighbor when she died yesterday in Redlands at the age of 74. She was also a convicted murderer who spent 48 of her last 50 years either in prisons in three states or running from the law. Her last two years were spent at 32361 Dunlop Boulevard, Yucaipa, on parole. Winnie was quite a personality, recalled Mrs. Ziola Silva, who first met Miss Briggs in 1954 as a supervising counselor at the Corona Institute for Women. She was always a fun person to be around, and I liked her. Mrs. Silva, who currently operates the Silva Knoll Rest Home in Yucaipa, was responsible for obtaining parole in 1972 for Miss Briggs, who was then serving a life term at the Corona Prison for the 1954 slayings of a Salinas man. I knew she wasn't going to hurt anyone anymore, and I didn't want to see her live out her days in prison. So I told the parole board I would sponsor her over here, Mrs. Silva said. She's lived a life of peace and happiness since then, end quote. The article goes on to say, 
quote, one fear she had was that she'd be sent back to Arkansas prisons, where she said she'd been burned, whipped, and forced to work long hours in the fields, Mrs. Silva recalled. Of course, their prisons aren't like that now, but Arkansas didn't release their hold on her until 1972, and she was always afraid of being sent back there, end quote. Perhaps the saddest note about Winnie's life can be gleaned from her father's obituary, which was published in the Miami Daily News Record, Oklahoma, on August 23, 1955, a year after Winnie returned to prison, which reads, quote, Final rites for William L. Spriggs, 83, will be conducted at the Friends Church in Wyandotte at 2 p.m. Wednesday. The Reverend Ermin Perry Show will officiate. Spriggs, a retired carpenter, died at the home of a daughter, Mrs. Lynn Voiles, in Wyandotte Monday. He is also survived by a son, William Spriggs of Miami, and another daughter, period. Thank you for listening to this episode, Beauty is the Beast. If you enjoyed the podcast, please be sure to subscribe, like, and comment. You can hear this and other episodes of Old Fashioned Murder and Mayhem on YouTube or your favorite podcast venue. Follow me on Facebook or Instagram for updates and more information. See the description box for resources used in this story. And please join me again next month for another episode of Old Fashioned Murder and Mayhem.